Thank you, Aina. Well, thank you very much, Aina, for your kind introduction. And thank you very much to the whole team of the National Center of Swedish as a Foreign Language for this invitation. It's a great, great honor to be able to speak here to you, to so many dedicated colleagues. And I truly hope that some aspects of our work in Leipzig uh, will be of interest for you, for your own work. So, as Aina already mentioned, I now work at the University of Vienna, but the research that I'm going to present to you was conducted in Germany and I will therefore refer to the uh, political and uh, educational situation in Germany and not to the Austrian one. What I'd like to do is, uh, first of all, I would like to mention um, a few brief facts about the situation of L2 literacy in Germany. Many aspects will be very similar to the Swedish situation, I believe, uh, from my cooperation with Swedish colleagues. Others are a little different. Then, in a second step, I would like to talk to you about the Lillebe project, what our aims and goals were, and uh, how we set up the project. And I will briefly go into language learner counseling in general, uh, the theoretical orientations that we used for our project. And then you can see number four is going to be the main point of this presentation. I want to show you a lot of concrete examples, and they will all be in German. Uh, and uh, I will try to, uh, I will try very hard to explain them uh, as best as I can in English. And I believe many of you will understand some of the materials, but I will make sure uh, this this works. So I will go. Um, yeah, I'll talk about that later. And of course, there's a brief conclusion in the end. Now, if we look at the uh, situation of L2 literacy in Germany. Um, I think it's um, helpful to point out that in the 80s, uh, Germany, like many other European um, countries, uh, only discovered the fact that there were a lot of illiterate um, people in the country. And at this time, the focus in Germany was not on immigrants at all, but the focus was on native speakers of German uh, who had gone through the school system and who had not succeeded uh, within the structures of the school system to learn reading and writing to agree that they could use it at a functional level in everyday life. And only in the 90s, after this argument had been made that literacy, uh, uh, illiteracy concerns uh, native speakers with a lot of formal schooling, only after that, in the, in the second stage, in the 90s, um, did attention shift to immigrants and German, German as a second language speakers. And literacy classes at the time were established um, for immigrants who wanted to learn how to read and write in German as a second language. Um, and many of the classes at this time were actually conducted using the L1. So we had, at this time in the 90s, we had very few classes uh, being offered for immigrants. Um, they were very often taught in teams um, of teachers, um, and they were often bilingual using both the first language and the second language. My colleague Jürgen Erfurt has called this uh, phase the emancipatory um, phase of literacy instruction. Um, so in this time, there were hardly any books that um, we could use for these classes. And the teachers usually um, started with a needs analysis in the classroom, asked the students about what they wanted to learn, what their concerns were, and then produced the materials, um, often bilingual materials, uh, and interculturally interesting materials um, for the students. Now, this situation changed a lot in 2005 in Germany when integration courses were established. Um, and uh, German as a second language became part of a national agenda. Um, it was no longer, we, we, we can not consider this any longer an emancipatory approach, uh, but we consider this a bureaucratic approach to L2 literacy, um, so at this time the number of students rose to a, high, to a much higher degree. Um, when the integration courses were established, it became obvious um, to a larger public that many of the students needed literacy classes, so 10 to 15 percent of our students uh, are now not engaging in regular integration courses, but in integration courses with a literacy component. And accordingly, the uh, field of the publishing companies has now produced um, uh, books for a curriculum that has been set up at the national, uh, at the national level. So there is uh, a curriculum that is be has been developed 
2005 and has continually been improved. The books are geared to this. There is a test um, that the participants are required to take. And I think you have very similar um, experiences in Sweden in this field. Um, so now, at this time, um, the number of participants has highly increased. So now we're talking about many more people learning uh, or taking literacy classes. And the focus now, unfortunately, uh, in my opinion, is only on L L2. So there are hardly any, uh, there's hardly any integration of L1 aspects into these literacy classes anymore because of the national curriculum that um, asks for instruction in German. If we look at this uh, curriculum very, very briefly, you can see that up to 1,200 units or lessons of uh, literacy instruction are to, are to be provided according to this curriculum, and the hope is that the learners will reach the A2.2 level, so at an advanced A2 level, um, but from the test result we see that this is not always uh, the case. The main languages, the main first languages of our students are Kurdish, as you can see in this table, and Arabic, but also Turkish and Russian play an important role. Albanian and Farsi are fifth and sixth uh, in this list. So we have, uh, as I imagine you also do in your classes, we have very heterogeneous groups. Uh, some of the students have very little experience in using a pen. Others uh, know a non-Latin script like Arabic or Cyrillic uh, and only need to learn or master um, the Latin alphabet and the German grapheme phoneme correspondences. Now, this is a yeah, brief introduction to the situation uh, in Germany. And uh, many teachers are unsatisfied with the situation they find in their classes. Um, they believe that the materials they have um, are not as helpful as they should be. They believe that the heterogeneous groups, um, that it's hard to serve the individual needs because of the, the great heterogeneity in the classes. Um, and therefore, we set up a whole group of unsatisfied people um, at the university, at the University of Leipzig, as Aina mentioned, uh, and then eight to ten language schools, this varied, um, who also wanted to, yeah, where there were teachers who wanted to change things and wanted to cooperate because it was, they felt impossible as a single teacher um, to develop all the materials that they needed for the class and who wanted to cooperate. Uh, we also involved the town hall, a very active uh, lady who supported us at that, uh, there. Um, we also had people from the field of migration counseling who had experienced in working with traumatized um, people, for example. There was a course coordination who tried to, to um, install a cooperation between the different private schools. They were all in the private sector and it was difficult to come up with a system where we would have levels, different levels of um, competencies because in the beginning any school wanted to take in any student and we only later managed to cooperate in terms of exchanging students to make more homogeneous classes. And there were others who were experienced in the field of uh, literacy or counseling who also joined the project. So we were quite a big group who wanted to do something and change something and we wrote a grant proposal and uh, we were successful, very happy, um, and we could start the Lilibe project. Oh, and I just see on my slides here that I mentioned, forget to, forgot to mention one thing. Of course, the, the, one of the greatest difficulty in the classes was also that very many students had very limited oral skills in German. So many students were below the A1 level and they wanted, or they needed, according to the curriculum and the uh, uh, setup of these classes, they needed to learn to how to read and write in German without being able to speak a lot of German yet. So, when we set up the project, we were able to employ two people, Stefan Markov and Christiane Scheithauer, who worked 70%, 75% uh, for two years. And they, the two of them, developed the materials that I'm showing to you today. So, it is their work. Um, and they had two years for this project, from April 2012 to April 2014. And the goal was to develop a concept for learner counseling in these German as a second language literacy classes, then to implement the concept uh, and to produce a brochure, brochure for teachers explaining the concept 
uh, and providing the materials. And from the very beginning, we were a little scared that it would be difficult to get funding for one-on-one -on -one counseling on a large scale, so we always had the situation in the classroom in mind. So when we tried this out in one-on-one -on -one counseling, we always thought, how can these materials also be used in the classroom by a teacher who is trying to counsel his or her students? Now, what you see here um, are the three big phases that we went through. Um, there was a planning stage from April to September where we developed these materials uh, on the basis of theoretical texts that we had read and ideas that we came up, at, came up with at the conceptual level. And so there were instruments and materials for this counseling process, but there was no actual counseling yet. This was a preparation phase. And then we had one year of counseling from October 2012 to November 2013, uh, where Christiane and Stefan actually counseled uh, 41 students. Um, they participated on a voluntary basis. Uh, they chose to be um, in this counseling, and it usually lasted 15 hours uh, per person. Uh, and on this basis, during the process, the two of them tried to further develop the materials, to improve them, to fine-tune them to the needs of the students that they actually met, uh, and to develop a final concept. So this was a long process of going over the materials again. And then there was an evaluation phase where we looked at the learning results. Did the readers, sorry, did the learners improve in terms of reading and writing? Did they improve in terms of speaking and listening, whatever goals they had set for themselves? Um, and then the publication, of course, was prepared. So to simplify it, we had three stages. We, uh, the drafting of materials, the implementation phase, and the, then the improvement. This was the approach. Now, here you see um, the students that were participating in this counseling approach. You see their first languages. And in green color, you see a high number of people who spoke Arabic as a first language. So in these cases, we were able to use um, translators for some uh, of the ses sessions uh, where it seemed helpful. Um, then there are many, many other languages, and we could not always provide translators, so the situations were varied. Sometimes we had people with high German oral skills, and the counseling was done in German, and it was no problem. Sometimes uh, we had translators to help with the counseling process, and sometimes we had a linguistically very challenging situation for the counseling um, sessions. The students mm, had varying degrees of experience with formal learning in schools. So the blue bar shows you that about 40% of our participants had uh, gone to school for more than eight years. So they were very experienced in terms of formal learning. Um, but you can see the green bar um, shows you that about 30% of the people who participated in this project had very limited formal schooling, zero to four years. So again, just like in the groups that we find in the classroom, also in this counseling project, we had a very um, uh, high degree of uh, variability. Yes, and Aina has shown you the product. This is what it looks like. Um, but let's move into the language learner counseling. So our starting point was the fact that we had read many inspiring articles about language learner counseling uh, in academic settings, you know, with respect to the discussions of learner autonomy and self-access centers and self-regulated learning. Uh, there had been many research reports on language counseling uh, with these academic learners at the university. For example, my colleagues Karin Klepin or Gret, Gret, sorry, Gret Mehlhorn or Michael Langer have contributed a lot to the German discussion on language learning counseling, and this inspired us to try it for this particular target group. Now, with the academic language learners, our colleagues had always used a non-directive approach to counseling uh, that was inspired by the work of Carl Rogers and his work on psychotherapy and had used um, the conversational techniques uh, of, of this approach for counseling. And so the idea is not to tell the student what to do. Um, it's not that the, pro the person takes a, 
problem into the counseling session and it's, it's then being solved. It's then be, it will then be solved by the counselor. But instead, the counselor's job is um, to have the student solve these problems on his or on her own, but helping them on their way. So we tried, we were able to use this approach um, of a non-directive learner counseling in the case that our students had already a rather high level of autonomy and in case that the linguistic situation was positive, so that the student had at least an A2 level in German uh, or that we could have counseling in the L1 by using translators. So in these cases, we did succeed, succeed in non-directive learner counseling. Um, but if the language situation was more difficult, so the German uh, competency level was below A2, um, and, there was, it, and it was not possible for practical reasons, reasons to have a translator for this particular language, uh, and the level of autonomy was also rather low, uh, then um, it was difficult to do non-directive learner counseling, and we actually did mainly strategy training. So the students were exposed to lots of different strategies that would help them solve a particular learning problem that they had identified and that they thought was relevant to work on. So we needed a lot of visual aids for explaining these strategies uh, and the activities and the evaluation. And then you see in the case that autonomy is rather high, but mm, the uh, linguistic situation is difficult, we had something in the middle, like a sem semi-directive learner counseling, where reflection was possible in these conversations, um, but the support by the visual aids was still very important. And here you see, uh, the situation, the linguistic situation uh, is pretty good, um, but l the level of autonomy of the student is yet still uh, rather low. We ended up with a similar approach. Okay, this is what it looked like. We had 15 sessions. So, in practical terms, the first session was devoted um, to, for getting to know each other, for building up trust and confidence, and the counselor and the learner talked about the learning biography. Then the second session was devoted to an assessment of the reading and writing skills uh, in cases um, uh, where it was appropriate, the phonological awareness of the students was also assessed uh, so that the learner counselor knew exactly at what stage of the learning process the student was, how developed his skills were. And then Two more sessions were devoted, um, as you can see here, uh, in talking about the strategies that the student already used for solving his or her problems and the particular goals that he or she was pursuing in everyday life. We tried to identify areas that were of real importance to the student. We also, I will show you in a minute, had a style inventory where we talked about learning preferences, like um, yeah, I also illustrate that in a second. And then, as you can see, he, oops, sorry. As you can see here, the main part, many sessions were devoted on the strategy training. So the counselor, after she or he had identified the needs of the students and the level of the student, then introduced different strategies, tried to model them, tried to explain them, uh, had the student practice them, and saw, um, had discussed with the student uh, uh, how this worked in real life and in the classroom and how happy they were with those strategies and whether they needed to be adapted in some way or, or maybe dropped because they didn't work for this particular student uh, or whether the student was really having a great success with these strategies. So the last session then evaluated the different strategies that had been talked about uh, and there was a wrap-up, a closing session uh, of course, you need to say goodbye in a situation like this, so the last session was devoted um, to this transition, to making a smooth transition. So, in many ways, our concept um, was similar, very similar to existing language learner counseling approaches. Uh, the goal orientation is an example. Also, the aspect of voluntary participation is very important and the reflection on the learning process. So this, this idea of having the student take responsibility for their own learning by reflecting on it and by becoming metacognitively more and more aware of their own learning needs and goals and uh, possibilities. 
And what was rather new, or what we had not seen in other research um, so much, uh, was this flexible degree of directivity. We had to react to the situation um, that we found by decreasing um, the, de the degree of non-directivity and this strong reliance on the L1. I will show you examples in a minute uh, how we tried to use the first languages uh, even though the counselors themselves were not able to, um, to speak the, the different languages of the learners. So, let me now come to the concrete illustration of these points. So, in the first session, Mm, you can see here, and maybe some of you can read it in German, uh, there is a conversation about the learning biography, the person, first of all, of course, the name and the, uh, the, the country of origin and the languages and age and marital status, etc., are talked about. But the main focus of this is really um, on the situation in the German as a, a second language class. So there is a lot of talk about what the student uh, likes, in the German as a second language class, what he or she experiences as helpful, as positive, and also what the problems are that this person experiences in this particular classroom, and what he or she usually does uh, if, he or, uh, if they experience these problems. So as you can see here, we translated these materials. If the student was able to read in Arabic, and this was the first language, then of course we used uh, the Arabic version and the uh, German counselor uh, could, of course, look at the German version in order to be able to cope with these two um, materials. Then I brought you this example. It's again in German. I will take you through it um, as an example for the assessment of written skills. So quite a lot of instruments were developed to assess the uh, level of competency in terms of literacy. And we um, used the Dutch alpha levels A to Z um, to orient ourselves. And uh, we further developed uh, a competency level grid. And this grid concerns lots of, or these levels describe lots of different competencies, like recognizing letters, uh, knowing about grapheme, phoneme correspondence, and being able to read. Uh, numbers, sentences, etc. And this is just one uh, little tiny excerpt from this um, that concerns the functional level. So we had uh, many descriptors um, for gathering information, for example, or for establishing relationships. So in the functional approach, we describe the we try to describe the different types of texts that can be read at an early stage in German as a second language. And uh, we also relied on the work of Elena Wagashauser, a doctoral student who did an ethnographic study of Russian second script learners and documented the, the, the kinds of texts that they wrote in their everyday and read in their everyday lives. And one of the interesting findings in this study was uh, that the student also used reading and writing at a very early level for the learning process. And so this is now uh, an excerpt from the huge grid, just a tiny excerpt. Um, where you can see that at the alpha level A, students cannot use reading and writing for the language learning process yet. Um, but at the alpha level B, for example, students can write down little notes, like for example here, no bell has been written down in German, in order to approach the janitor to tell them that the bell is not working, is not ringing, and that to ask the janitor to actually um, do something about it. Um, so this is like a scaffold that the student produces for himself to approach a person in German as a second language. And he uses this to then orally be able to master the situation. Or at a higher level, here for example, we have a student who goes to um, a bank machine who wants to get cash out of this bank machine and he writes down a sentence that he can ask somebody. For, uh, what he writes down for himself is, I want to uh, uh, I want to grab money, or I want to get money, is, I think is a better translation, please show, okay? And so this then serves him as something that he will take with him to the bank machine, and when he's trying to manage getting money out of this machine, he will read the sentence and approach a person to help him with this. So these scaffolds um, are examples for the alpha level B, or the alpha level C, excuse me, <coughs> 
and also taking notes. Sorry. <clears throat> taking notes like here um, at the word level or taking notes uh, at a sentence level in order to write down things that you want to remember, that you need to remember, information that you need later. Uh, these are also epidemi epi sorry, epidemistic uses of language. Okay, at a lower level, um, we assessed phonological awareness in ways that are probably uh, well known and that I will only briefly mention. For example, to identify the position of a syllable in a word or synthesizing syllables or naming syllables or naming the number uh, of syllables in a given word, identifying rhymes. So in these cases, we tried to see whether the student was able to do this. And it was particularly important in these cases to, cases to do it in the first language if there were no oral skills because it's obviously a co very complex process for somebody who approaches this task. So the question was, can the student identify phones? Can he or she localize the position uh, of a given phone in a word? If you have something like car, and you ask them, where do you hear the k sound in the beginning or in the end, for example, or to name the phones in a word, or to synthesize phones into words if you, say, if you have k, a, r, what is it? What do you, if you put this together, what do you come up with? And if, then if they can say car, there is already a high degree of uh, phonological awareness. Or you analyze words into phones, so you ask them to break up a word like car into the three compon components. Um, for these goals, we develop materials that looked like this. So here you see items that you find in a house, for example. And uh, let's take this example, the sofa, because it works well in English uh, as well. So the counselor would then ask, where do you hear fa in sofa? And the student had to decide whether it was in the beginning or it was in the end. And we cut up the paper here and covered the objects and only after the student had decided, did he hear the fa in the beginning or in the end, did we uncover this? And then the student could look at the sofa, the object, and at the word, and then it was confirmed that his decision was right. Yes, you hear the fa in the very end. Uh, or if it was wrong, they discussed it uh, again. And as I already mentioned, it seems important to us that we do these kinds of um, diagnosis in the L1 uh, if there are very little oral skills. So here you see an example from Turkish and uh, we recorded all of these questions. Where do you hear ta and tabak, for example, in the Turkish language so that the counselors um, and also other counselors are able to, if they don't speak Turkish, they are able to use um, these diagnostic tests uh, in the first language. And I realized there's a mistake here. It should only be key, and then the second syllable is tap. I apologize for that mistake. Yes, or at a higher level, uh, here the same procedure. You can see the picture is being covered up, and now you have whole words. Um, and then the question is um, whether uh, they can uh, for example, and, uh, tell you the number of sounds or phones they hear in a word like this, or whether they can um, produce the first sound, or whether they can analyze it. Now, let me move on to another example, mm, the learning styles. We all have different preferences in learning, and these concern um, the ways that we take in information, so some people prefer to do it visually, others like to touch things and move things, Others like to listen real closely. Um, we vary in our ways of processing information. Some are very closure-oriented, want clear results, clear structures. As others are very open-ended and want a more intuitive approach. Uh, also in terms of per personalis per sorry, 
personality styles, we all differ. Some of us are more extrovert and gain the energy from working with others, while others are introvert and need silence and being on their own to concentrate and to work well. And so the learning style inventory in the fourth session actually um, uh, was to make the students aware of the fact that we are all very different in this degree and to have them start to think about their own preferences. And we had many items. Here you only see items number 9 to 12 for illustration, but there were many more that the counselor went through with the student um, and talked about them, whether they like to do certain things, like I like working with my hands and I like to play in the classroom or I like to work with others and uh, I usually learn uh, well by myself after class when I'm alone. So counselor and student went through these different, um, these different um, preferences and came up with a profile in order to make the student more aware of his learning preferences, of his needs, so that he or she could be more articulate about it and could also reflect on why in certain situations they were maybe frustrated and what they could do um, in order to change, to change this. Okay, maybe most important, the fact that counselor and uh, learner together discussed um, the learning goals of the students. These could be oral goals, these could be written uh, or goals concerning reading and writing. Um, here you see uh, reading and writing. And so, again, this is an excerpt from a longer piece of materials. You see different um, situations, everyday situations, like at work or while I'm shopping or using the internet. And uh, in terms, so first of all, in terms of listening and speaking, oral skills, counselor and student would discuss, um, you know, whether these situations are important, whether the student does work and doesn't want to improve using German in this particular context, uh, whether the student does use the internet or doesn't. And so this was, first of all, to find out in a, in a way in a, uh, of um, a needs analysis which situations are important to the students, what they do early in this particular situations, how happy they are with it, and which situations will now have to be uh, focused on in terms of reading and writing. And then these decisions were uh, written down here, this is important for me, in this particular situation, I want to be able to do this or that in writing and reading. Yes, and then they talked about all the different strategies. And maybe because you are professional um, language learners, you have already forgotten the many strategies that you have used for language learning. Maybe as language teachers, you are very much aware of these strategies and talk about them in your classrooms, I'm not I don't know. Uh, but for the L2 literacy field, strategies have hardly been described. So for language learning, we have a very solid, uh, very good description of language learning strategies. But for L2 literacy classes, um, we didn't have this. So we tried to, um, from the literature, from the pedagogical practice, we tried to uh, come up with a list of strategies that are important for L2 literacy. And then also from the list for language learning that we already have had for some time, since the 90s, um, we tried mm, to present these strategies in ways that the L2 literacy student would be able to remember them. So the first step was to, to observe the student. The, the counselors also went into the classrooms and observed, and they looked at the materials um, that the student brought with them from their classes, and they tried to identify what kinds of things the students were already doing. For example, using gestures for sounds like A or A in German, uh, or using pictures of uh, the mouth. What does the mouth look like? What does the position of the lips look like when I pronounce a certain vowel? This is another strategy that you can see here. Um, reading with a mirror as another strategy, or using little cards that show the onset, where you have a word, like alarm, uh, and then you have the A there, and so this is to help the student to remember the sound of A for alarm, uh, using these onset cards, or writing in syllables, not 
writing a whole word, but if you have a word like photo, you just you um, uh, distinguish it into or you separate it into syllables, and you write in syllables. First of all, you concentrate on fo, and then on to, and then this way you write photo. Or, for example, drawing little lines under the syllables to be able to read the word. Um, so these are, again, examples for many different strategies that the counselor had in mind and uh, was trying to identify what was the student already doing, what was he or she already using and using successfully. Okay, and then if there was a strategy, strategy that the student did not know and uh, the counselor saw, thought it was an appropriate strategy for the developmental phase that the student was in, then the counselor suggested a strategy uh, like writing in syllables. This is the first one. And what we tried and what was new about this project, um, we tried to produce strategy posters where we had pictures that explained the different steps of the strategy. And so this, we hoped, would be a scaffold for the student to remember the strategy. Of course, the counselor started by explaining the strategy in an abstract way, how you do this, and by modeling, by actually doing it with the student. And this way, hopefully, the student uh, understood how the strategy worked and especially what kind of problem it can solve. Um, uh, but then the poster with these pictures um, was to be taken home. This was also translated, first of all, it was recorded so that somebody who can't read uh, can listen to the descriptions here, to steps one through four. And these uh, were also produced in translated versions, so also in Comanche or Arabic uh, or Turkish, the student could listen to this if he or she had forgotten how the strategy worked. So they had a CD to work with. And as you can see here, first of all, the idea is you listen to the word, then you speak the word and you go like this for fo, to, you make two movements like this. And then step number three is I speak aloud mm, and write down. So you, now you have separated the word into fo, to. So you start with fo, you speak it, you write it, then you continue with to. And then you also uh, put these little bows uh, in order to mark the syllables. We also successfully worked uh, with onset cards, cards that showed, that used a word like Lampe, German lamp, uh, in order to, uh, to help the student to remember the sound L. And very often in the past we had experienced problems where the student would come up with the concept uh, in their own, the word in their own language, uh, and this would interfere with using the first uh, the onset of the German word, and so we particularly looked for words that were similar in German and in this case Arabic. So I don't speak Arabic, but uh, as somebody who doesn't, I can find here the phonetic transcription. Um, uh, and obviously it's Lampa, and uh, so very similar, same, uh, or a very similar sound in the beginning. And so we worked with these kinds of onset cards for the students to rely on if they wanted to look up again what a certain sound, sorry, what a certain letter, uh, how a certain letter is pronounced, or if they wanted to write a little sound that they could identify, lamp, and then by this way find um, the grapheme that co corresponds to it. And of course also in such a um, way of presenting the learning material, uh, it becomes obvious that certain sounds like the O sound, which is part of the German, uh, phoneme inventory is not part of the Arabic uh, phoneme inventory. So in this way, the student also gets alerted to the fact that, oh, there is no O sound uh, in Arabic, and very often O and U uh, become confused, and so this is also a help to make sure, oh, there's something in German that's not there in Arabic. Okay, but we not only focused on this low level of um, decoding and writing words. Um, we also had students who were more advanced and who were also interested in aspects of grammar, for example. And here is a strategy for grammatical learning. Um, the idea here is, or well, the strategy is called, I compare German and my first language, my mother tongue. 
Uh, and here the idea is that the student hears, this is an ear, as you can hopefully uh, uh, recognize, uh, the student hears different sentences, like the house is wonderful and wonderful house. And the second step is I ask myself, what's the correct way to say this? Yeah, how should I say this sentence? Is it this one or is it this one? And ask somebody, like a teacher or a competent peer, who answers this question, and then notes down the correct version of the sentence, the house is wonderful, and translates this. So this is obviously a strategy that can only be used if there is first language uh, writing skills. And so the sentence is noted down in German, and the sentence is written down, in this case, in Arabic. And then symbols are used to identify similar objects. So house is... Um, there is a circle being used here, and the element of house is also identified in the Arabic sentence. Uh, and then, you know, the student compares the word order, the syntax in these two sentences, and then come, comes up with a, com with a result, what's similar, what's different. For example, in German you need this is, just like you do in English, whereas in Arabic this is not existent, uh, and there is also a different word order. Um, this was a grammar strategy. Let's also look at a conversational strategy um, to compensate problems in oral communication. There are a lot of compensation or communication strategies. And uh, one, of course, is to um, not despair, if you don't know the word, um, but to go on, to smile and to try and to do things to solve this problem. Uh, and here you see Stefan uh, saying, uh, hello, I need, and then not knowing the word for Band-Aid, okay? And so here you see him realizing, oh, I don't know the word for Band-Aid, I need to do something about it. Uh, and maybe you can find in the shop, you can find the object and then just ask for the word, what is this called in German, or how, uh, what's the term for this? Uh, or if you can't find the object, you know, you show your finger, uh, and you kind of try to um, compensate the situation even without having the words. So this is about encouraging students to be bold about our communication and to try out uh, different compensation strategies uh, in difficult moments of second language use. Or this one, I, I brought you the Arabic example. Um, and so what we see here is a metacognitive strategy Many teachers um, and also the counselors had observed that the students had, uh, some of the students had trouble organizing their materials and finding uh, certain aspects of learning materials that had already been covered. And uh, what you see here is a person with lots of materials in an unorganized way. Uh, and then the person decides to actually sort them into an order uh, and then uh, punches them and puts them into a folder, and this is maybe hard to see, puts a date on these particular materials, uh, and then, you know, it's ready for use. So this is also a strategy that for some of the learners with little formal schooling proved to be quite helpful. Now, in the end, uh, after these 14 sessions, um, sometimes also in between, uh, counselor and student tried to evaluate the strategy and they had a conversation about does this strategy really help you because there are alternatives. You know, if I recommend a strategy, it's not that everybody has to use the strategy, but it's, uh, there are several ones that I can, you know, that I can try out and see which one works for me and maybe also they can be individualized and changed to a certain degree. And so this was our material to start a discussion of does this help you? Does this improve your learning? Does, is, it, is it really helpful for you? And so we had uh, the different strategies. Here it's now I compare German and my first language. Um, and then the counselor and the student talked about whether this sentence is true. I do this at home. I use it. I do use it. Um, and the student said, yes, I do, or no, I don't. And if, if it was a... Sorry. If it was a strategy that was being used, then they talked about, does this help me? And here it says, this doesn't help me, it helps me a little, or it helps me quite a lot. Yeah. So the student was to decide, to, using a coin or some kind of object that could be used along this continuum, um, 
the student decided uh, how helpful the strategy was and also talked about whether he or she felt that I can do this, I'm competent, I can master this strategy, I can use it. Uh, or I, yeah, I'm kind of used to it, I can do it a little, or I can do it really well, so I'm competent in using the strategies. And so then they decided together, I continue with this strategy, or they decided, no, I, uh, sorry, I don't continue with the strategy, or I do continue with the strategy. So a decision was then taken whether this way was to be pursued or maybe to be stopped because it wasn't, the student didn't feel it was so helpful. Okay, and there are other strategies that can be used for the same purpose. Okay, so let me come to my conclusion. I uh, think we were highly successful with this learning counseling. Of course, it was a very privileged situation uh, with this one-on-one this -on -one counseling, but it was interesting for us with this very new materials that we had not worked with uh, before, that the students were very excited and very enthusiastic about talking about their learning um, and that they very happily voluntarily participated in the sessions. There's usually a lot of uh, complaining about students not participating in the classes to the degree uh, that the responsible persons want them to participate and we had no uh, problems whatsoever in this case. Um, people were very eager to come and to make use of this, uh, th these offered counseling sessions. And we believe that in order to be successful, Learner counseling in the field of L2 literacy should possibly be done in the L1. We realize that there are limits, to, practical limits to this, but we think that it's very important for the languages that are frequently, uh, that, that, that are frequent L1s, that we have learner counselors who can do the counseling in these uh, migration languages, and uh, it should provide early enhanced and printed materials in the L1, so we were happy to see that with these uh, translations of the posters and the CDs, um, students were um, willingly uh, and hopefully, no, sorry, uh, full of hope to work with these materials. So they were accepted by the learners, is what I wanted to say. Um, and it should be goal-oriented. So it was very uh, important to the students that they worked on a goal that they had set for themselves, and they were very different goals, according to age groups and gender and many different aspects. So they had very, very different um, goals and the learning process, the, sorry, the counseling process really focused on these goals. And because students were highly motivated for these goals, uh, they also took on the responsibility for the learning process. We believe that learner counseling should introduce the students to strategies. Most of the time I talked about examples of strategies reading strategies, writing strategies, speaking strategies, grammar strategies, metacognitive strategies, social strategies, how can I find partners to help me with learning Swedish or German. Um, so the introduction to those strategies and then helping them to effectively employ these strategies. So there needs to be some time where you are with the student. You cannot model this, this strategy and the student will be able to use it, but you need to help them to automatize these strategies. And only then, after they have really mastered the strategy, can they decide whether it's helpful for them or whether it's not so helpful. Um, and then this evaluation has to be done and the student has the right to reject the strategy and say, no, this does not work for me, I don't want it anymore, I need something more visual, or I need something more auditory or more social, whatever. Yes, and then last point. Um, the uh, learner counselling should encourage reflection on learning and thereby increase the sense of self-efficacy so that the student feels, I am in charge of this and I can do it and I can now identify problems, I can come up with solutions and I can systematically uh, improve my learning process. That's um, our results and if you are interested, in finding out more about this, I would like you to have a look at the uh, site of the Waxman Publishing Company and use this information to look at the Arabic and the Turkish posters. Maybe some of these can be helpful uh, also for the Swedish context. I realize in some cases, if it's about German orthography, it will not be very useful for you, uh, but maybe some of these L1 materials can directly be used and others I think you can easily transfer if you think this is an interesting concept. 
There is an English publication online where you can read more about this project, and I'm sure many of you can also read German. And if you go to the Lilibe project website that you find here, um, then you can find German articles uh, on this particular project. Yeah, that's it from my side. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you can use some of this in your classrooms. Good luck with your work. Thank you very much. Applause